What's up, everybody? Welcome to another installment of Talk and Watches with the Cardinal. This time, the Late Late Show. I've got an extremely special guest. Uh, I'm honored to have you on the show, of course. I want to thank you so much for joining me. I got the real Cars and Chrono. That's his Instagram <laughs> handle right here if you do want to give him a shout. He has an incredible car and, most importantly, watch collection. Uh, and, of course, again, I want to thank you for joining me tonight. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks, Marco. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like I said, before we obviously started the broadcast, I wanted to pick your brain a little bit because we don't get, you know, a lot of collectors like yourself. And obviously I made a video for you reviewing, you know, a pretty extensive part of your collection. Your collection has grown considerably since then, even though, you know, you still have a pretty considerable watch collection. Uh, I'd love maybe to start off for those of you, for those who maybe don't know you, uh, how you got into watches, you know, the, the whole shebang. What's maybe a little bit, what's in your collection, what's your collecting philosophy, that kind of idea. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So thanks, uh, Marco, the watch cardinal. <laughs> First off, uh, thanks for having me on. Big fan. I've been following you guys, obviously, for a while, you and Tim Wright and now JJ. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, I just really keep it short. My watch uh, uh, collecting story really began with my father. It's, uh, it's very cliche. Um, immigrant from Korea, he had a gold Rolex, right? And uh, as an immigrant come from Korea, like getting a gold Rolex is like, uh, yeah, really the grail at the time, and introduced me to the uh, the overall concept around watches. And then from there, you know, collected had a Movado, had a Tag Heuer, um, and uh, and the journey just continued. And luckily, you know, through my career and just opportunities, been really blessed to. Uh, yeah, be in the position to actually get pieces that uh, uh, really just resonates with me. Um, just in terms of the overall collection philosophy, you and I have spoke about this at great length, right? Uh, it just has to resonate and connect. Uh, there's this whole thing around the narrative, the backstory, the design. But uh, as we saw today, if there's a piece that you see, it just jumps out at you. And uh, that's really been the underlying fundamental um premise behind you know my approach to watch collecting and you know one thing i do really harp on so as my name implies cars and chronos i'm really into cars and as well and uh, i've spoke about this at great length you know you have the peanut gallery sometimes chime in and have opinions around cars as well as watches without ever driving one and uh, actually handling a piece and they just say oh i hate this brand i hate this car but have you ever tried them and I, I think a basic tenet that I, I do try to, not always, 100% of the time, is actually handle either the watch or the car. And once you actually put it in your hands, you physically work it, then you truly know whether or not you are a fan of the brand. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of it in a nutshell. <laughs> I just want to pull this up very quickly. Ari, too, with the $5. Yeah, thanks, Ari, right, man. Thanks nice. so much for the Thank generosity. You, Welcome, Cardinal Corona. Like I said, it's an honor to have you. And the reason I want to do this interview style kind of one-on-one -on -one is I'm really, really impressed by a lot of the choice that you made. And I can't say that for a long because I'm into the, the crazy end of the spectrum, you know, of the watch world. Right. And one thing in particular that you've dived into deeply is mostly the independent world, right? A lot of Jorn and a lot of various independents. And that's mostly uh, what I personally enjoy collecting. Now, if I can ask you, what made you take that kind of leap of faith, if you will, yeah. into that that kind of space. Yeah, so uh, one of uh, uh, actually a dealer who's now a good friend of mine uh, told me is like, so, you know, what's the gateway watch, would you say, into the, not not the Mario Brothers Tag Heuer. What do you think the gateway watch is <laughs> into watch collecting? <laughs> oh, man, that's hard. I would I would have to say it's probably a Rolex, right? It's yeah, once, Rolex. You, once you get once you get your first Rolex after that, by the way, a quick wristwatch check. I'm wearing the noted sub today. Love to know what you're wearing on the wrist. Whew, I saw that flash. I had to. I had to get that in. That is, guys, the Vacheron Historiques 1921, the Excellence Platin. That's unbelievable. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, and those pictures really that that doesn't do it justice at all. You guys got to see that. Yeah, that's, with most that's of these easy. watches, right? None of them ever do it justice. But uh, yeah, so Rolex. Uh, I would say, and, and by the way. I, I know there are folks who also shit on Rolex, uh, but there's a reason why Rolex is great. Aside from the amazing branding and marketing, I mean, they're a marketing branding machine, but they make amazing watches. You know, I was, you know, you saw me on IG. I was out in um, 
Kauai, right, uh, last week and just diving. I'm an avid uh, diver, and I have no qualms just going in, just beating the crap out of these watches, and they are absolutely two watches. Uh, but you get to a point where, you know, you have a few Rolexes, and it's just like, okay, what else? What else are we doing, right? I mean, what other pieces out there? And, you know, obviously, yeah, there's Paddock and the eight piece, and you know how I feel about eight piece. But then it starts, you start broadening your horizons, right? Because once, if you're really an avid watch collector like yourselves and all the enthusiasts are probably staying up watching this channel, um, you want to do a deep dive. And then that's when you start getting exposed to all these different brands. And where else are you going to go uh, than to some of the independents? Because the independents is truly, these are the, because I'm an entrepreneur, right? And the thing that always resonated with me around the independents, these are at heart also entrepreneurs. I mean, they are they're artisans, but they're also entrepreneurs. And, and that's where the narrative comes in around like understanding the story of where they came from and why did they get into watchmaking and, and how they made that long journey. That to me connects me then to the brand, uh, particularly with independence. So yeah, that's pretty much how I get I'm going to comment that in just one second, but I did get a $10 super chat. Very kind of you. Thank you so much, Bruce Ross, with a $10 super chat. It says, here's my belated 1K. Congratulations. I appreciate that. Guys, if I'm able to do this, it's because of the support of the viewers. So I really, really appreciate that. And, uh, you know, it really does mean a lot to have your guys' support. So thank you so much. Onwards and upwards. And, uh, you know, I hope yeah, it's only yeah. up from nice. here. But, yeah, listen, I totally agree with you. And I was bringing this up earlier in that you can't compare or you can't evaluate, rather, a Rolex watch versus, you know, some of these big name independence or, you know, these kind of high hero, higher horology brands, right? The way I evaluate a Rolex is how rugged it is, how durable it is, its tool watch kind of aesthetic, and also the timelessness of its design, right? I think you can also say that for a number of models, for example, I would say the Breitling Navitimer definitely falls in that category, right? It's not horologically the best watch, but it has history. It has, uh, it's a design icon. I think you could talk about the Cartier Santos, the tank. I mean, there's a number of watches from Cartier. You can talk about the Blanc Pen 50 Fathoms. I mean, even the Patek Calatrava. Yes, it's a beautifully finished watch, but more than anything, I think it's a design icon because its conception has transcended time, right? It's a watch that is timeless. It's truly timeless. So there are different ways of ultimately evaluating a wristwatch. And definitely for me, I, I'm totally on board with you that when I look at the independent space, it's really what I'm passionate about because it's that micro artist, right? That, that person who dedicates their life to really a passion that ends up becoming something bigger than themselves, right? It's the pursuit of perfection. And yes, nothing will ever be perfect, but one can certainly try to achieve that in some form. And I think that is really uh, the beauty of the independent world. So yeah, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I, I think like the watch is a side, right? There are people behind these things, right? These amazing Umbrella's machines that we have on the wrist. And I mean, you can just, uh, yeah, you can like what you're looking at. I mean, you see the time, you like the movements and whatnot, but to understand like the effort and the, and the effort goes into the design, the movements and just the metals and the craftsmanship. I mean, that just adds a lot more to the overall story and narrative of what you're basically holding in your wrist that essentially is just telling you what time it is right at the end of the day aside from the other 54 complications that maybe these does and that's that's what makes you appreciate it more right so i'm absolutely yeah <laughs> right we got another super chat thank you so much amj i really do appreciate that with the four dollars and fifty cents australian love the non rolex chat we get from our cardinal you know guys i think the rolex topic gets chewed up and spit out a lot I, I hope to bring you and open up your – broaden your horizons and open up your mind to the wristwatch, the broader wristwatch world. Yeah, and, lots, uh, more, I, lots more than Rolex, right? <laughs> right, exactly. I think – I mean, even – listen, even at the entry or entry level, right, there's a lot of stuff that you own yourself, right? The Kodoki 2, I think, is a phenomenal wristwatch. I mean, it's really incredible. And we're talking – pre-owned or you can buy it from him personally right mm -hmm. for yeah. less than a lot of what rolex yeah. retails at and again we're talking about extreme craftsmanship in the way that it's designed conceived and ultimately finished yeah absolutely i mean when you uh and that's again that's an example actually of a piece that i've never handled right so as much as you make the effort to actually see them in person uh but yeah when he won the award right the horology award and you hear his backstory and how 
he basically, I mean, you see him, right? And it's all online the videos. The extent you can actually see um, making the piece. I mean, it's just, I don't know, there's an analog component to it that uh, is being lost. Like, you know, it's this whole cliche, right? We're all going very digital and that's fine. But the analog effort that goes into making these pieces, that's what we call it. It's, it's basically art on your wrist. And this is just a work of art. And again, these pictures just do not do it justice. When you put this under a loop and you see that complication and they basically the engraving and the detail that goes into that, um, yeah, night day uh, complication, I mean, it's just next level, right? And uh, again, now whether or not design speaks to you, I mean, I've I've heard you know I've shown it to folks. Somebody, some folks, ah, it's a little, maybe not their style, maybe a little bit too. Sometimes I heard goth or a little bit old school, but uh, I mean, it's it's just the detailing and the craftsmanship. It's just yeah, it's just a work of art. And yeah, I didn't I didn't put a picture of the uh, the the movement on the back, but, right? I could pull yeah. it up. I could definitely yeah, pull it but, up. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there will be a lot of comments around the uh, uh, the movement. But again, it's just it's it's beautiful. It's it's just a beautiful uh, timepiece, right? And it and relative again, relatively speaking, in terms of affordability, I mean, these aren't commanding like ridiculous uh, premiums in the market. I mean, you could just and, and that's the other thing about the and this is one thing I got to really call up about Kentucky is uh, like you can just reach out to them and they'll interact with you. And that's something that's also lost with the brands. And then again, it's not a, I'm not being judgmental, but you can actually like reach out to them directly and they will interact with you and they'll talk to you about the piece and you'll get them directly uh, versus, you know, dealing with a large corporate entity, right? And that's, that's something, and that has, that's meaningful, right? We talk about the boutique experience. You're actually speaking to the guys that are making, making these pieces. You know? Right. Uh, there's a difference between, in my opinion, showroom experience and the experience you have with somebody like this. Right. I mean, uh, I think it was a, an interview with Watchbox. Oh, I was this amazing collector. He had an, a, a number of independents and one one person who works there, his name is CQ. He said, you can spend upwards of a million dollars for a certain brand. You can't even get somebody on a phone. Right. In a piece like this, you can entirely custom. I mean, you're talking literally with the watchmakers who work there. To ultimately create the piece of your dreams, right? Your vision comes yep. to life essentially. I just want to uh, pull something out very quickly. Joe Kramer with the one dollar super chat. Thank you so much, my man. Guys, I just want to do like a one on one interview. Then I will open it up to everybody else to join if you would like to join. But I do want to pick his brain because I don't get to talk to <laughs> a collector like this all the time. Now, I do want to bring this up because it is important and it is something that I think is often overlooked in a conversation where we're comparing some of these brands, right? So he's asking Moritz Grossman or Longa, and I'd love to get your, of course, your perspective on this, who was better. In my opinion, it's an invalid comparison. Here's why, because yeah. they're different watches, right? It's not a question of what's better or what's worse, right? Both of them are at the highest level of finishing, right? If you choose one or the other, you genuinely can't go wrong. It's really what sings to you, what's, what pulls your heartstring and what you would be proud of wearing because both are phenomenally made and executed watches. It really comes down to what you prefer. Yeah, so again, it's, so this better question. All right, so there are things where you can absolutely say what's better, right? So better, when you look at it from an objective standpoint, right? right. Fit or finish, movements. Uh, yeah, you can make it- There are some objective here. qualities that make a watch good or bad. Exactly. But at this level, I mean, at yeah. this level, we're talking the highest level, right? The best right. of the best. That's exactly it. And in, and again, I don't have as much uh, experience with the uh, Grossman. I, the long as though, I will say. So the double split has been my experience. I've obviously handled the Zeit work, uh, the perpetual calendar, um, even the Odysseus, which I think frankly speaking is a little bit hyped just because they're stainless steel. Uh, I mean, the long as, oh, man. I mean <laughs> – the movements on there is just next level. And uh, I, I mean, if you're going to make, I guess, a comparison gross, man, I mean, long, uh, it, it, I, it's, I really struggle to have a direct comparison with the depth of the long and movements right now. People refer to them as hockey pucks. They're just a little bit chunky. Right. Thick. But when you, you can just deep dive into these, like you're basically like in a city. Right, a mechanical city of movement, and I, I would really encourage uh, anyone that has never handled the longest in person, particularly the the chronographs. I mean, it's just, 
it's just amazing. Like the first time I saw it was just like, you know, mind blown. Um, this is a picture you did take yeah, this on is your it. Instagram. Exactly. This is absolutely, I mean, uh, guys, this is stunning. You know what I mean? But, and again, that's why, that's whether that's the shortcoming of these photos, but the depth, and you put a loop to this, I mean, you will just be completely engrossed in terms of, uh, yeah, just the, the overall, like for the, there's a design, absolute design element, but the fact that we can actually build something like this in this day and age and put this on your wrist, I mean, it's just, yeah. I mean, the science behind this is just, is amazing. It's phenomenal. And I think long in these type of movements, I, I mean, Barna, I mean, I, I'm really strong to see another movement that comes close in terms of the depth and the, the character of this. Now, of yeah. course, one thing that is valid, right, is the type of complication, right? Because you can't compare like a double split longer to a Moritz Grossman, which is, you know, yeah. some some are mechanically speaking a lot more, you know, technically proficient. But when you're talking about double split, I mean, a double split might be one of, if not the hardest complication to assemble. And then they obviously got the, the triple split. But I think one thing about Longa is they, they build their movements, right? So they'll they'll actually case up their movement once and then take it apart and do it all over again, right? So, I mean, it's pretty incredible, the attention to detail. And listen, it's true about all independent watch brands in that regard. So I think it's hard to say who is better. I think there are qualities that will certainly make one watch objectively good or bad or better than others. But to say one is outright better than the other, especially when we're talking at the highest level of horology of watch finishing, I, I just don't think yeah. it's fair no. to, to I, talk I, about I, it. Like I, that. You know, I, yeah, I, yeah. I just have the opportunity to just go into the boutiques. Uh, hopefully things are opening up soon. And um, yeah, just check them out. I, 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 these photos and every time I see these, like even new releases online and then you see them in person, it's just uh, next level. Very, very different experience. Well, one thing that I still don't understand why um, I guess you can call the watch brands haven't caught on yet is why in the world they still continue to use computer rendered images to show off these pieces. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. You know, like get a photography team, get like somebody who's a professional photographer to photograph these pieces and show them off in the correct light. Because at the end of the day, I mean, it just doesn't make sense to, to sell pieces. I mean, that we're talking Sometimes upwards of, you know, a hundred thousand, even, I mean, we're talking upwards of 10,000 at that point, in my opinion, you should be using a professional photography team to show off the pieces that you're selling. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. 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 I just want to call out Jeff. Thank you so much for the $5 super chat. I really do appreciate it. So I do want to transition into, I want to say probably your favorite or what seems to be your favorite independent watch brand, which is FP yeah, Horn. And sure. oh, I yeah. got, I had to get a picture of, probably my or the movement of my yeah, favorite movement. horn yeah. right this is the chronomate yeah. optimum so i mean this is this is my favorite I, obviously i want to ask you first and foremost how you got into jorn um uh, in the first place yeah so again it was that transition out of the uh the what i would characterize the big um watch suppliers like rolex and paddock and so forth and uh yeah it was actually <laughs> Uh, one of my contacts, as well as Watchbox, you know, they're a very big Jorn dealer as well. And uh, yeah, they put me onto it and said, hey, have you ever really considered actually purchasing one of these, right? I mean, you can, and again, these watches, let's let's be, I mean, I'll be very blunt about it, right? These are not cheap, these pieces, right? right? Um, and, uh, but at the end of the day, when you see, like, and the design just resonates with me. So again, the first thing, that immediately that catches my eye versus just, yeah, there's there's a lot of hype, right? It's relatively recent, like people are into the Jorn bandwagon and I know the folks have been collecting these for years, but the design, does it really connect with you, right? And the first Jorn, this was actually the first Jorn um, that just really resonated, right? So I know the case, the back looks amazing, but me, I'm a sucker for, uh, first of all, chronographs, but the black, white aesthetic as well. Right. right, and you just it's just like a dial that, yeah. I mean, it's just the stark contract of it makes it, in my opinion, yeah. right? It's that color the binary, and the black. Yep, mm -hmm. that that binary element to it around the black and white. It's uh, that to me immediately just drew me into it. Right now, I'm also I, I'm a suck for guilloche. I love guilloche in terms of dials. Um, now you can go a little bit over, right? I, so I know you're a big fan of Carrie, uh, yes. and 
I mean, okay, that's a completely separate topic. Right. But like, yeah, the subtle, um, the, the guilloche, the the remitor as well for folks who understand that technology, which is just also next level. Mind blowing. Yeah, it's it is mind blowing. I mean, it's just like it's just all these different elements coming, and then you understand the story around Jorn, right? His youth. Now, obviously, there's some maybe myth and component to it, uh, but uh, understanding the narrative, the story, and how where he came from and how he built up the shop as an, also an entrepreneur and then getting to know the folks that actually are part of that whole genre circle so i mentioned you know i was at Lorenz's birthday party right i mean they brought me into that circle and they and it's just a really good group of folks and i mean there's probably a little bit of an echo chamber component to it but understand the people and their philosophy and what they're about yeah you know, all these things that contribute to becoming a fan of a brand right uh, I mean, it, it, it sucks that the supply is constrained only because there aren't so many um, folks out there. There's not a lot of pieces out there. Even if you go to uh, the boutiques, uh, like you can't pick one up. Uh, but uh, and again, that scarcity element also plays into it. As we all know, people want what they can't have. Uh, but there's all these different aspects that come into why. Uh, yeah, at least for myself, what uh, really attracted me um, to it. Yeah, that's right, JJ. Can't wait for your right. first card, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Gentleman's hangout with a $2 super chat. Finally, some Jorn chat. I'm sure he's not too far away himself from adding his first Jorn. But yeah, you know, it's really interesting, his story and, and the way he came up. You know, I heard, or I heard, apparently it's kind of this, this kind of story myth in that Jorn got a lot of street cred. Now, in, in typical FP fashion, right? In that somebody wanted to get a tourbillon pocket watch from george daniels right so at the t i think it was in the 80s or something like that maybe the 90s i, I can't remember what the the year was it might not have been the 90s but at the time right there was very few watchmakers who could actually do it but apparently that customer was a huge pest and george didn't want to make it for that particular customer right so he actually commissioned fp to do it and so one of the first pocket watches he ever made was a tourbillon pocket watch specifically for that customer just to stick it to George Daniels, and he never branded it. He actually never branded yeah. that pocket watch, which is hilarious. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, that's the story at least behind it. But I, I kind of came on to Jorn and that I think the philosophy behind his brand and behind the way he creates his watches is incredible, right? And one thing I will always say, I don't care how incredibly finished a watch is, I have to like how it looks, right? And one thing that I tremendously commend FP for is I know for a fact he pays extreme attention to the dial of his watches because mm -hmm. he says if it's not good looking and not worth, then it's not worth wearing, right? That and the back. The case yes. backs are in some respects even more sometimes, I mean, dare I say, prettier <laughs> than the actual dial, right? It's mm -hmm. like, I mean, I mean, is rose gold a little bit overkill for the movements and all the... <laughs> right. I mean, you do it because you can, right? It's it's a little bit of, uh, I guess you could call it horological flexing, it's right? Horological flexing flexing on your absolutely, it's absolutely a horological flex, but right. it's gorgeous. You're definitely flexing it's absolutely on your gorgeous, right? Right. <laughs> and again, I mean, I did a video of, and this is very subjective, of my top three, you know, kind of my holy trinity of independent watchmakers. And the reason I selected Jorn to be a part of it was not just because of, uh, not just because of obviously the incredible commercial success, although I do think it is important to mention it because, you know, if any, if anyone is responsible, I think for the growth, especially in independent watchmaking or the growth in interest, at least in independent watchmaking is because of Jorn. but you also have to factor in the incredible ingenuity that he has. I mean, the number of complication that he's really done in such a short period, I mean, it's something definitely to be celebrated. Yeah, I mean, if you go to his website, you see all the the range, right? Uh, yeah, I, I think the one that even JJ um, is looking at is a different. It's actually one that I don't actually own as well. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's really tough, right, for an independent to have such a broad range to actually build and produce an equality. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that is also a part of the appeal and allure, right? I, I keep going back to the scarcity of economics. And it's reality, right? As much, and we see it in even the big brands. Um, it's it's something to be desired, also, because aside from the fin finish, is that people want what they can't have, right? And I'm not sure if it's really intentional on their part. I, I truly believe uh, it is definitely supply constrained. I mean, obviously, COVID didn't help either, 
Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, folks, once they get into the brand, they go deep. Um, it's it's waiting lists galore, right? I've been waiting <laughs> for some time for that resonance as well. I'm not even sure he'll, he'll get to it when he, he's going to get to it. <laughs> it's the feedback that I get. <laughs> All right. I mean, listen, these are not easy watches to get. I just want to pull up this comment right here uh, from a line says, so what do you think of Roger Smith in the Isle of Man? I'd love to get your perspective on this. Yeah. Roger Smith again. So again, I keep coming back uh, to the narrative, right? Uh, so again, and this is where I'm going to actually be honest, where I've never actually handled uh, the Roger Smith pieces. And I would definitely be uh, speaking against my own philosophy around the, uh, if it's something that will actually resonate and connect with me, I mean, design wise, Roger Smith doesn't always necessarily speak to me. It's one where I, I think uh, from what I understand, the fin finish is also uh, really solid, but uh, yeah, I think I'd probably speak out of turn unless I actually handle it. Right. Hand as well. You know, I think I'm kind of with you. The design, listen, the design is a, a very traditional kind of round case shape type of watch. Right. But, I mean, there, there's nothing really to say other than they're incredibly well made. You know what I mean? I mean like this, but he's yeah. he's an incredible watchmaker. There's there's no no question about it for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to pull this one up in particular because it is my favorite Jordan, as you know. And the by the way, that's my favorite as well. Just FYI. <laughs> yeah, it's my favorite. Well, because it's the one that FP would make for himself, right? So <laughs> I'm pretty sure the story of this watch is he had a client who said. Well, if you wanted to make a watch or design a watch for yourself, what would it be? Well, he said, I would want something that is, you know, complicated, but that is also, you know, functional, practical, and that is accurate, right? And the whole point is this has what's known as a remotoir de galite. So we talked earlier about, unfortunately, a potentially failed at this point Zenith purchase with the chain and fusée. <laughs> now, a remotoir de galite is another type of constant force device, right? Uh, which essentially provides a constant amplitude over the course of a power reserve of a yep. watch that Which will is stop, amazing. right. <laughs> that will stop the, the big imbalances of power um, it, it, in a watch movement when it's fully wound, when it's minimally wound and everything in between. So uh, I love this watch. I love the design of this watch. I mean, I wish I could add it to the collection, but I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is just, yeah, this is some next level watchmaking. Yeah, right? I agree. I mean, this, uh, even to me, so the Loon Havana is the other one in the clutch as well as the, the vertical turb. Um, yeah, I would say this by far connects with me the most. And the vertical tourbillon, first of all, it's a little bit thick, and the tourbillon is really cool. I mean, when you see it, again, when you're handling the person, it's – I mean, it's a work of art, right? I understand tourbillons aren't considered maybe the most uh, difficult to manufacture, and this is obviously speaking to other folks in the industry that maybe um, compare tourbillons to other complications, but it is absolutely a work of art. Um, and then the Lujo Havana. I mean, that's a cigar piece, basically, right? That little chocolate dial, of, of course, with the guilloche and the, and the moon phase. Um, yeah, just, just really pretty uh, right. pieces. But by far, this one, um, yeah, it just connects on, on levels. that It's just sometimes hard to also articulate. You know? Right, 100%. I just want to pull some, up some chat. He says, carry <laughs> over Jordan every day of the week. Twice. Listen, I, I'm with you. Carry is my favorite independent watch. But again, guys, I think it comes down to this this idea that you got to buy what sings you. If you don't buy what sings you, I mean, you're you're not doing it. And that's the other thing about Kim and Jim. So that's fine. Uh, but have they actually handled both pieces and compared them side by side? I mean, exactly. That's, right. that's what I always love about the commenters here, right? And if they have, that's great. I mean, show me the photos. Let me see them on your wrists. <laughs> and that's where sometimes it gets, yeah, the conversation goes a little bit sideways. I, t I tend to agree with you. You got to try these on before you can honestly critique them. You can obviously critique them from the outside, obviously looking at, you know, kind of the text and specs, but it, it's, okay. it's a very shallow, it's a very shallow um, analysis in my opinion, yeah. for sure. Yeah. So we got a question from Eddie Fu who says, Marco, pull up the Marine big day. You think it's a great value? No question about it. This is obviously a steel sports watch from Breguet. Breguet Marine with a big day complication. You get a real Rosely guilloche dial. Uh, same thing on the rotor. So you get, again, Rosely engine turned rotor uh, on the actual movement. Let me see if I can't find a picture. And, of course, whenever you want to show somebody something, there you go. You can never find it, but it looks like I found it. So, I mean, these movements are hand-finished, beautifully executed. The one problem I have with it really, and I'd love to get your, your opinion on this, is the lugs. 
there's something about Breguet lugs. They just irk me a little bit. Like, I wish they cropped them a little bit. Like, they're so long. They're so long and protruding. Like, I don't get it. Why do you keep your, your lugs so long? It's just, it irks me a little bit. Yeah, Breguet. Yeah, yeah. Listen, Breguet, they're the OG, right? Think about right. the <laughs> watches. Um, and again, maybe it's just my uh, my watch collecting uh, taste these days. It's a little bit too classic for me. I mean, nothing against Breguet. Actually, I would happily own a Breguet, but it's just something that uh, doesn't speak to me. Um, you know, I've, every time I see a Breguet retail store, whenever I travel, I absolutely go in, try on the pieces. Uh, but uh, yeah, as far as great value, I, I don't know what these are. I mean, how, how do Breguet's, Breguet's hold up? Are they... Uh, yeah, they're, pre they're pretty bad on the secondary market. You can get them on for a phenomenal deal. So that's that's one thing that definitely plays in their favor. I mean, you ultimately get an amazing watch for the price, right? So if you are if you enjoy this kind of style, again, the lugs is my biggest problem. I wish those lugs were cropped a little bit, and, and I would, I mean, I would recommend this in a heartbeat, but you definitely should try this on if you enjoy it. Then, yes, by all means, it's a fantastic watch for the money. We got a question from Riss Ross. He says, "What do you guys think of Jorn sports model?" Yeah. So the titanium and uh, yeah, I, they uh, listen. Uh, if you like the light pieces and uh, uh, I mean design wise, uh, I, to me, I actually do like them. Uh, it's not one that I prioritize in terms of the collection, um, and I think they're definitely holding value if that's something also of interest. Uh, but yeah, I think definitely solid pieces, um, and they're just so light. On the wrist, and I, I don't mind titanium, by the way, for folks who uh, maybe equate the weight of the piece with uh, what you have on the wrist. But uh, if you can get it, yeah, absolutely, I would definitely jump on on the sports pieces. Right. We got a question from Michael Schur who asked, "Do you think the secondary market will burst?" I hate this kind of question. <laughs> I man, it's the wrong question to be asking. You know what I mean? Listen. I think everybody Nobody has a crystal goes. ball. Go back to tulips. That's all I'll say. In the right. <laughs> Nobody has a crystal ball. You know what? I, we can like there are factors that we can make assumptions on, and that we can guess, and we can think about, and take into consideration. Do you think the secondary market will burst? It's hard to say. You know what I mean? There's a very limited supply. There's very high demand. And there's a lot of factors that I can say in favor that it'll keep exploding more, or that it'll you know, maybe soften on the secondary market. But if you're wondering, you know, because you want to purchase one, if the secondary market will burst, you're buying for the wrong reasons, in my opinion. Okay. It's, it's just, it's not, it's not for the right reasons, right? I, I, I don't, I don't want you to be buying watches as and trade them as commodities. But I want to move on to the next part, which I did want to talk about this vertical tourbillon here from FP Jorn, because I think this is phenomenal. So, I'm a big proponent that vertical or tourbillons rather are just at least in modern day watchmaking, they're a waste of money, right? Because your wrist technically acts as a tourbillon, right? <laughs> they it, it, it acts yeah. as the 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 balancer there, the yin to the gravity's yang, right? So they're they're kind of useless in watchmaking. There's only a couple that I know actually perform their function, and one of them is these, right? It's it, it's FP Jorn's vertical tourbillon. Now he obviously had before the tourbillon souverain with uh, kind of just the regular, I guess, horizontal design, and then he turned it vertically. Now, I'd love to get y your your kind of take on yeah, what, so what attracts you. Right? Well, in terms right. of right, so what attracted me is yeah, it's just I think it's really pretty, right? I mean, aside from the science behind, you know, when you had pocket watches that dangled versus when you put on the wrist and they're you know sitting now horizontal, right? And he was trying to calibrate and account for gravity. And okay, sure, I will. Okay. That's fine. Uh, but to me, I, when you, again, this is one of those, when you put it uh, on the wrist, you handle it. Um, it's just, again, it's something that uh, to me is a work of art, right? And again, art's very subjective. And you look at the finishing uh, and you can actually see through the tourbillon, you see a glimmer in different lights. And this is where, again, the photos don't do it justice. The one thing I will say about this uh, tourbillon, it's a bit thick, it's big. It, it, it wears very big, it's 42 millimeters. Um, uh, and as long as you're okay, and I don't mind uh, larger pieces, right. uh, but uh, yeah, in terms of when we talk about wearing functional art, this is definitely one uh, that uh, absolutely spoke to me, right? And uh, yeah, something very super subjective. 
um, around the piece. I just want to pull up a couple of comments. He's Kim and Jeff Bressler is asking, have you ever looked into Keaton Merrick? Myrick? I've, I've never heard of this brand. Have you ever heard of this brand? No, no, no. Sorry, no, I wish I could it. answer your question, but it's unfortunately I have no idea who this is. Cool Chris Kelly says, any thoughts on buying the Breguet Marine Chrono Arita? I mean, I would listen, guys, I would save yourself the money. Get it on the secondary market, guys. Yeah, I save think we can. Save yeah, yourself the extra few, bills. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I think people realize that there are very few pieces actually, well, brands that really hold value and appreciate, right? If you look at the right. entire universes. <laughs> right. Uh, and the other one that I wanted to talk about is this right here. So Laura Flex says, more Toronto didn't realize the stream were ongoing. Hats off to you putting in a full day's work. Well, Cars and Corona, thank you for making you know, yeah, the appearance absolutely. on the show. It's, it's when, easy for me. I'm a West Coast guy. So. Right. Super when you said you wanted to continue the show going, I was going to go to bed. But I said, oh, no, I can't. I can't. I got to get this opportunity in with you to, to pick your, yeah. your brain a little bit. So but, yeah, I this is – Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I was going to say, I mean, for me, I really I, – I admire the kind of technical prowess that he just doesn't put a Turbion in a, in a wristwatch and then just says, oh, here's a Turbion for the market. You know what I mean? He has – well, I don't know if he, he worked on this because I don't think Jean really works on watches anymore, at least the more contemporary stuff. But I know for a fact that the team that works for Jean is thinking about functionality, right, You. They're making watches that are useful, uh, not just you know trying to kind of hurt the end consumer, or make make a quick buck, so to speak. So that's the idea. I, I really appreciate the functionality behind this first watch. So I, I want to pose a question to folks, right? So uh, and maybe going a little bit off the beaten path. So I know we're look, talking about pieces, uh, and this is obviously a, a watch community. Um, I mean, the reason why you know, I call cars a chrono is there's definitely a mechanical resonance between watches and cars. And I'm curious, is there anyone in the community that are watching? We only have, what, 50 folks watching. Do any folks actually have that affinity between the two, the things that are analog and mechanical, or is it just all about watches, which is fine because this is obviously a watch stream. I'd love to get folks' thoughts to just chime in on that. Um, I'm one of the few people I think you probably yeah, no, know that. I'm not a big car guy, I'm like, but I appreciate the mechanics behind a car right in the same way that I appreciate the mechanics behind a wristwatch, but – you know, from like, I, I'd much rather have the watches. That's that's my main point. Like, it's not that I I dislike sports cars or anything like that. I think it's um, it, it's 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 great and it's cool to have. But man, I just had bad experiences with cars that it kind of tainted uh, my relationship with them very early yeah, on. Fair enough. <laughs> well, I know AMG have, probably does though. Give me some hundred percent AMG. <laughs> yeah. Mercedes. We got a lot of. Right, we got a we got a lot of collector watch collectors specifically that are big into cars, and and it's a natural kind of pairing, you know what I mean? Because yeah. anybody who appreciates kind of fine wristwatches will also appreciate the kind of fine finish and attention to details that it requires to make a sports car, right? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We got a question from Angie it says thoughts on Debathune. I mean, we t we brief we briefly touched on this earlier. Uh, again, it's highest level of watchmaking. It's really a subjective design. The only one that I really like design-wise is the DB25, the Star Various that I recommended in my review. Otherwise, the design is just too out there for me. It's just, it's not for me personally. Yeah. So maybe uh, should we go off with Jordan a little bit and start bringing in some other folks or you want to check out some other pieces in the collection? It's all, yeah, it's let's all do it. Know. Oh, hold on. We got Gentleman's Hand. He's like, Gentleman's Hand says, cars and watches are like peanut butter and jelly. Oh, yeah, yes, absolutely. that is. That is a good point. That is a good point. Now, one brand that you've been getting big into, I, I do want to talk about your piece that's on the wrist, oh, is gosh, my favorite, probably my favorite of the Trinity, or my favorite probably Swiss brand is Vacheron Constantin. Now, I'd love to talk about what, what got you into Vacheron and uh, why this piece in particular spoke to you. All right, so I'll be very honest with folks. So we got, what, 54 watching? So I'll be honest with you guys. Vacheron are probably the nicest to me. <laughs> in terms of the, uh, if you were talking about the Holy Trinity, and nice to me in terms of just the overall experience when you go into a boutique, right? So, um, <clears throat> you know, I moved to LA a few years ago, and uh, yeah, I came into you know, folks who are maybe follow me on the on my gram. Uh, yeah, got really close with the folks over in the hills, Beverly Hills the boutique, and. It's one of those things, and I, I don't want to really – I really want to emphasize, right, a 
a lot of part of the watch club is the community, like folks that are even watching now and uh, folks that you get to know through the uh, relations with your ADs. And while, yes, I've got re relations with Paddock and Rolex and whatnot, I will say Vacheron really opened their doors and they wanted to educate me. Uh, there was no level of snobbery, elitism, which, uh, you know, to this day and age, you still get a lot of that uh, despite your buying history. Uh, and that to me just really connected. And of course, once you start diving into the brand, you just see, yeah, the history and the heritage, right, uh, around VC. Um, you know, my first was the overseas. This was when overseas was not a, at all where it is today. Um, uh, cause I, you know, again, it was a piece that I love the blue dial, right? When you see the overseas in person, you can really deep, deep dive into it. And that from there, the journey was on. Right. And, and that was a funny story with, uh, the 1921 is, you know, when this came out uh, earlier this year, it was because of that relationship. And, and this is really, and it's so cliche. We talk about relationships matter, but, this was a piece uh, which uh, it's limited 100 around the world. Uh, North America was maybe getting about 40. I, I, I don't want to misquote, but you know, they maybe roughly about half. And uh, there are other folks in the queue that, uh, you know, obviously big spenders spent a lot more money than me. But because of my relationships and where I just really connected with uh, the folks in the boutique, they put me up on the queue and super blessed. And and the reason why this actually. It's probably one of my favorite pieces. Yeah, my affinity with cars, right? Uh, I mean, if you know the history around the 1921, yeah, I know there's a whole preacher story, the horses. Right, and there's three different stories I've yeah, heard at this point. Of it, to me, is about the cars, right, at the end of the day. And when you're on the – when you're driving, I'm looking at it right now, and I'm driving on the steering wheel, it, and it's, it is really silly. But, yes, you see it exactly. It's cool. Broken. It's cool. I was, I mean, it's one of those I mean, funny stories, right? right. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. It gets listen. It, it gets you, I guess, revved up a little. I mean, what else is there in watch collecting it, if we don't make a couple of memories and have a good time while wearing these pieces? You know what I mean? We got to enjoy these pieces while wearing them. So yeah, I've heard three different stories, but see, Christian Salmoni kind of broke my heart and said that the the car story is an urban myth. It's like a legend. I don't believe that. Listen, Christian, I like you a lot. I think you're doing great things for Vacheron, but you gotta, you can't say stuff like that. You know what I mean? You. You, you got to keep the, the dream, the fantasy alive. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, this is just a phenomenal piece. As you know, I think this is the greatest yes, iteration definitely. of the 1921 they ever made. Yeah, one of my favorites. Uh, I mean, and again, the strap, right? And the threading with the platinum tubes. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's just crazy what these people do, right? So if, if people under, uh, know this piece, I think if you scroll through some of the photos, uh, the actual threading are platinum actual tubes. Yeah, I was showing uh, that off. So, yeah. So the thread are actually these little platinum hollow tubes that they basically stitch together to make the stitching of the straps. It's um, insane. Yeah, you, and they, they really do have to check out. Yeah, I mean, you have to see that that in person to really appreciate it because it is just next level. And I mean, the style is just fantastic. It's just, yeah, this is. I mean, this is spot on. It's, it's as good as it gets, in my opinion. Uh, and yeah, Vacheron wise, uh, let me ask you because you are a cars and Chrono, right? And I don't, I don't. Do you have any manual wine Chronos in the club? I think you got the Moser right now. Mm -hmm. That that kind of fills the role. Mm -hmm. Now, you ever considered one of just like a simple manual wine Chrono, like Paddock VC? Especially my favorite is the Corn de Vos, right? Because especially those those articulating loves, they're they're yeah, kind of so art. I, I have no issues with manual. I have no issues because. Uh... I don't put them on winders. So at the end of the day, I've got to wind every single one of my piece uh, right. that I wear, right? Which outside of the perpetual calendars, which are a little bit annoying, um, yeah, it's like interaction with the piece that uh, gets you back, maybe back in touch. Yeah, and I've seen a few comments around my IG. So, yeah, I mean, if you guys uh, uh, do follow, uh, just I don't know if you're able to message. Just let me know that you saw it on the Marco stream. I do try to keep it pretty private. To just uh, friends and family, so just yeah, shoot me a message. Just let Marco know. Yeah. Now I do want to talk about this trio, going to another Trinity band trio of Patek Philippe, and I did see, if I'm not mistaken, one of the initial pictures you did show me. You had a 5712, right? I don't know if you still yep. have that one because I know in the review that I did for you, I didn't actually see it. 
Yeah. No, I, I got rid of the 5712. Um, okay, nice. 5980 yeah. is pretty worthy <laughs> upgrade, I guess you can say, right? Yeah, so uh, as much as, yeah, you don't know, flip, I am still a practical person, and it's just ridiculous what people right. – yeah, and that's one I got at retail. So why wouldn't I, right? And made room for other pieces where you actually have can get a precious metal in there as well. So we do have my friend, friend of the show, one of the first people to support me on this channel. I don't know how he found me or why, but I'm extremely grateful. Is the Dubai oh, expat? Yeah, absolutely, Dubai. Oh, absolutely, yeah. He's got Thank an amazing guys. channel, guys. He's got about twenty five thousand subscribers. So I'm sure you guys have heard of him before. I'm sure you guys are probably already subscribed. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe on his videos. He's got an amazing channel. Really, really great stuff. But, yeah, Paddock, Philippe, I mean, listen, when we're talking complications, I think um, Paddock does it very, very well, maybe the most classical. I don't want to – I just want to touch on this kind of briefly. Um, obviously, these are three extremely heavy-hitting uh, Paddocks. A any, any particular reason why these spoke to you or any yeah, reason so why you kind of have an affinity for Paddock? Yeah, so I mean, it's Paddock. I mean, right, it's Paddock. I mean, I got self-explanatory. Oh, I mean, so let me just say that right. it's, it's Paddock. Uh, but beyond that, yeah. Um, so after the fifty-seven twelve, uh, I got the uh, salmon. Uh, I always wanted a salmon dial. Uh, to me, I think the this particular so reference. I don't know yeah, why. I, mean, it's, I think it's still uh, in production right now. If I, I don't think it's been uh, retired or whatnot. But I always wanted a salmon, and as much as the Breitling is a really equal comparison to this. And I know <laughs> probably predates this is maybe in some circles, uh, design perspective. Uh, but yeah, again, I, I just love, and the salmon, again, when you put it in the light, I mean, and the reflection, it's just, it's on a different level, right? The, the pink shades change. And it just sounds like really kind of crazy hearing me say, oh, the pink shades change. But yeah, the, the characteristics and the personality of the piece actually uh, varies depending upon you know how you look at it, which light you're looking at. Uh, from there, I went with the weekly call travel. I love just love the weekly. I mean, the reason why I like, it's just it's just not really padded as well. If you think about the the fonts and the story behind you know how they came yeah. up with the steel call travel, it reminds and to me. I mean, it sounds again really silly. It reminds me of Peanuts. Uh, you know, I grew up on Peanuts and uh, the cartoon. You know, Charles Schultz and whatnot. And you look at the font and the story behind how they came up to it. And I'm a again, for that one. Sorry, man. I don't okay, get the reference, yeah. but I'm sure there are people so in the chat who know. <laughs> yeah, so folks who uh, maybe came up, grew up in that era, yeah, with the Charlie Brown Christmas and Thanksgiving and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, again, and that's the one piece when if you, uh, yeah, you know it, Hans. And by the way, Hans, I'll absolutely approve, uh, yeah, uh, the IG follow. Um, when you see it also uh, in person, this is one that actually surprised me the most uh, uh, on the wrist on the loop, uh, the details and design behind it. Uh, it's just a fun piece as well. And as you can describe, Paddock is fun. And the RG, yeah, I was in a queue. I mean, I always wanted a precious metal, uh, rose gold. I don't have, I'm not really into precious metals. The only one I would characterize as uh, pieces that I actually do like in PM is platinum. But this one, rose gold, when I first saw it, I mean, it's just, uh, yeah. It's a heavy hitter, right? The Hefe. It's the king of sports chronos, I would say. The king it's of the sports Hefe. chronos. Right. Yeah. Yoshi Y says, is that a remote watch case? How do you like it? Yeah. So it is. A, yep. Good eye, Yoshi. Uh, it is a remote case. So here's the only thing I'll say. It's not good to travel, man. It's uh, freaking heavy. So if you're <laughs> going off for watch meetups, if you're going to post it on Instagram, <laughs> that's when I would recommend buying this. But traveling with it, it's not really optimal. But it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful case. Uh but, and, but to answer your question, I do like it. I actually do like it. <laughs> I like the blue. The blue. You know the blue is my favorite color. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, they... I do want to also mention one more uh, watch, and then we could get some people on. And it's this one right here because I yes. think it kind of symbolizes everything that I'm saying, right? You can get amazing design, right, amazing chorology that is off the bean path that is different from what everyone else is doing, and you don't have to spend – you know, a lot of money. And these watches obviously are trading for ridiculous premiums on the secondary market, but it wasn't always the case, right? Well, I, even just a year ago, right? I mean, right. <laughs> I mean, you guys, uh, I think did, I think there are a few folks that actually bought the last year, the Salmon Dial right. uh, release as well. 
uh, I mean, yeah. So again, so you know, there's that independent uh, watch committee, the independent group, right? I forget the the name of that group. I actually have the book here. Here it is. The HTI, yeah, so, right? I think that's H what it's HTI. If you guys don't, if you folks are independents, uh, absolutely recommend mm -hmm. this book. Uh, but yeah, so Hajime was part of that HCI, and uh, if you look at the designs, uh, oh god, this one—it's it, a little bit smaller on the wrist. I mean, it's okay uh, for myself, but it really is like a tuxedo on the wrist. And you know, I'm like a broken record now. The photos don't do it justice. The details, um, the pushers, the quality of the pushers, and the feedback you get—it's just choice, right? You just click on it, and you just have that analog uh, reaction to pushing on the, uh, yeah, the pushers. Uh, like this is one that I'll definitely keep. Now this is a keeper, right? We just got a couple, what's the size on this piece? I think it's 38. I think it's a 38, 38 mil if I'm not, yeah. Yeah. So a little bit but small yeah, this for is, my wrist. Yeah, but. Right. I, I mean, this is, this is what I'm saying, right? You can get a lot of great watches, but the thing is you do have to study this kind of, you know what I mean? Because I mean, Hajime Asaoka, who's the watchmaker behind Corona, right? I mean, he's an independent watchmaker who makes very few watches a year. I mean, we're talking uh, probably less. Than, I, I think at, at one point we made five watches a year. That's how complicated they are to make and finish and, and design. But one thing that's interesting about his story is, again, he's another guy who's big on how a watch looks, right? Because he was a designer himself before he became a watchmaker, if I'm not mistaken. And you know, he really puts a lot of attention and strain on how a watch looks. So this to me, two register chronograph, the, the design is just, it's stunning. It's perfect. And again, it's you balanced. don't have to, exactly. You don't have to have like a an insane platinum case watch. You know what I mean? And that's what I appreciate about your collection is that you have such a wide variety and you show amazing taste throughout the board, right? I think you show a real appreciation for horology. And I hope people have, uh, have uh, you know, I hope it shines through in, in our conversation here tonight. So I am going to open the floodgates. I'm going to, I'm going to sure. drop the link if anybody wants to join in and continue the conversation. I'm going to keep this kind of succinct. I don't want to keep everybody up forever because I am pretty <laughs> tired myself. But we do have Stefano who's been waiting for us in the background very hey, quietly. Stefano. <laughs> Sorry, hey, buddy. Uh, it's all good. Good. I'm enjoying learning about FP Jordan. I'm not a big FP Jordan guy, but that hey, piece you brought up with that blue dial was gorgeous. With the white strap, but uh, it's, it's yeah, actually black. It's black. Oh, it's black. It's actually black. It's actually yeah. black. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's a FP. So for those who don't know, FP Jorn black label. Now, as far as I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, they make two of those watches per model per year, right? So there will only be two of that made every year, and then that's it. They're they're done. They're not making another one with a black dial. So we're talking about rarest of the rare when it comes to FP Jorn, at least modern. Modern FP short. Gorgeous watch though with the white strap, it pops. Yeah, this, you know, it's funny. Like when I put the white strap on, I got a lot more comments oh. than the actual piece itself. I think, yeah, the white strap actually definitely. The white uh, strap because it takes off from the little, I guess, the little Gilo shade dial it has, the sub dial. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's or what's playing the on. Time dial. Let me rephrase that. But I want to yeah. ask you a question with your Kudoke. I've been looking for a gold dragon for a while. But watch buys is the only place that sells them. But I just well, shot out a week ago an email to the company direct. Yeah, the company is pretty responsive, actually. So typically, you know, when I'm very responsive, maybe retailers that uh, when you told when you tell them that you spoke to, Oh, no, I know they don't them. work through their distributors. Yeah, because they have no representation in Canada, them. and I sent that email that th there's no representation here, only in the States. Hold on. Here, guys, do me a favor. Can we just turn off our cameras? Because I, mean, I think we're I mean, shoot me a note if there's any way I could be helpful, Stefano. Right. Just turn off your camera. There we go. Okay, perfect. I think we're, we're good now. We got you back, Harley <laughs> Crow. Sorry. We lost you for a second. Oh, did you lose me? No, no, you're all good now. You're all good now. Sorry, you want to just you want to just say that all over again because we lost you for a second. 
No, all I said was, uh, yeah, for for Kadoki, they usually work through their distributors, but um, the the corporate is pretty responsive. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure they'll turn get off back my videos. Because... Well? Uh, no, I mean it's all good. Here, I'm going to turn on my camera. If anything, just let's I'll keep it to us. Too, but... Right, right, right. Just because I think uh, the bandwidth is it's 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 high. When there's so uh, I reached a lot out of people to them on the uh, last week. So I'm waiting. Well, this week passed a few days. Wednesday, I think that I said there's no representation in Canada. I'm looking for one of your golden dragons. So I'm just waiting for a response. I said, there's nobody in Canada that carries you. So. All right, so Golden Dragon, shoot me a DM. Oh, if you, yeah, I can, I, I, I might be able to. I, I just sent you a request for Instagram, but my professional, the one that I sell watches on, even though I'm an yeah. architect, I've been sidelining and full-timing since 1980 with watches. So it's just in time I sent you the message. Okay. All right, I'll check it out after the after the stream. Yeah. Let me ask you, the Golden Dragon, are those one of his hand engraved pieces? Yes. Okay, the nice. Yeah, because hand engraved, silver and gold. Right. Yeah. So for those who don't know, I think Kodoki himself rose to fame. He worked for, I believe, it was Habring, right, Richard Habring, uh, for a while. And what what he was mo most known for was his engraving work. And that Kodoki too that you saw, it was a hand engraved. Uh, night and day indicator. So yeah, I mean he's he's exceptional. Oh, he's, comes that to dragon oh, looks amazing. Got somebody else in the background. We got Hans joining us. What's up, Hans? Hello, hello. Thank you for joining the stream. Is this Han Solo? Thanks for letting me on. I think this Han Solo. Solo. It's Han oh, this Solo. This is Han Solo. What's up, brother? I thought you were this, Matthew this Egan. Hey, I thought is. you were Matthew Egan. I am. I am. I had okay. to change it up though. Is that okay, a date like sub or no date sub? That's a date. That's a date. Very nice stuff. Hey Hans, where are you? Uh, where are you calling in from? Where are you at, bro? Boston. Boston. Ah, you know I'm New York Yankees man. I lived in New York for. Uh, uh, years, uh, uh, <laughs> he's a mass hole. He's a mass hole, as they would say. Have to kind of have a yad. Shit. Yeah. Oh, Boston. That's, all right, all good, bro. We're talking I watches. Love, I baseball. love the Red Sox. I love the Red Sox. The Bruins, yeah. the Patriots. I love them. But but what what new watch? Um, I added uh, cars and Chrono on Instagram. Hopefully it accepts. But you know, no, goes, but um, what what new watch did Joe Joe Kramer get? I got I got the Millie. I got the what Rolex Z Blue Milgauss. Damn, know, it's not quite the top of hierology. It's it's, it's nothing compared to Michael's Bat Girl. But you know what? I, I take pride in it nonetheless. I take it's another steel sports I can add to my collection. Definitely. Hey, listen, any Rolex is a great addition to the collection. It's yeah. nothing to spit at. You know what I mean? Like, there are people, and it was something that Oshin brought up to me uh, when I was actually streaming with him. He's like, Man, you love the independent world so much. You know, those worlds usually don't coexist. Why do you, you know, kind of own Rolex? And I told, like, I actually thought about it, right? Because I wasn't sure, but I appreciate, and I did say, you know what I mean? I own Rolex, not just because they they make a phenomenal product, but it's the idea, the history behind Rolex, the design, and what, what Rolex used to be, ultimately it's not used in the same way, but it's a rugged, durable tool watch that you can, you know, kind of do anything, go anywhere with. <coughs> it doesn't have to be the fanciest movement or the, the greatest finishing in the world, but it gets the job done every time, and it's it's a design that certainly speaks to me. So that also, mark on your money safe. Like I don't, I don't care if you buy the Oyster Perpetual or the the Air King, the day just your money is safe. I mean, whether you'd like to admit that or not on air, I mean, it is what it is. Right. Listen, I I will never say um, obviously buy watches with investment in mind because it's just not not what I believe in. You know what I mean? And it's not the way I think you should be collecting, but. I mean, yes, that is definitely a component of owning Rolex. That is that is certainly <laughs> nice to nice to see. I, I just want to let the chat know if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask us. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may or may not have for us. So, um, yeah, I'll just pull up a few chats. We got Lord of Flack asking, "Milgas is awesome. Crazy that you guys that you couldn't give them away a decade ago. Uh, okay, could you give them away? But no one wanted one, right? That that is very true." Absolutely. And gentlemen, hangout brings up a good point. Your only, your money has only been safe the last few years. So yeah, I mean, they couldn't give these away. Let's be honest. You you go back to like 2015, you'll see guys passing by a Rolex 80. They had pretty much every model in stock, you know. 
So it's only been as of recent that the market, I, I like to say that the turning point was the Paul Newman Daytona auction. From then, people realized watches could be used as a commodity and the whole wristwatch market kind of exploded. With so if, if, if the Milgauss is, um, what is it, magnetic, like it's not magnetic, you know what I mean? So are all the other watches, like I have a Datejust, you know, 41 millimeter, and then I have the sub date, are those magnetic? Like if I hold a magnet to it, it's going to be like, you messing it up? Um, no, because they do have silicon hair springs nowadays, and I believe the escapement is also silicon. So those are all both anti-magnetic. Um, I believe Rolex is fine. Like there shouldn't be a problem with magnetism. You know what I mean? Like unless you're yeah. using a very strong magnet, but I would never recommend also for you to hold the magnet up to your watch. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, like, if you want to do it to a computer screen, I don't think you should do it to your watch either. For you know science, I mean? Michael, for science. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Got to test it out, right? No, nah, 10K ain't worth it. I'm not, I'm not putting a magnet to a 10K watch. <laughs> Maybe a right. Casio. Um, yeah, so gentleman's hangout says that wasn't the case. So just keep in mind that you guys are building a Rolex portfolio. Exactly, guys. You should definitely buy them because you like them first and foremost. I did get a question on Instagram, if you don't mind, Cars and Corona, going back to your collection. Uh, he wanted to ask, what were the watches in your collection that you would never sell, that you would never, ever get rid of, that will be with you kind of forever? The idea yeah, of actually, super. Yeah, that's easy. So first off, my uh, Deep Sea, because it came from my wife. Right, wedding gift. Yes. So that's that's uh, low hanging fruit. Uh, beyond that, I think definitely the 1921 because this one was one that was actually built over a relationship, and I just love the design and uh, the fact that I'm actually into cars. Um, I'd say if there was a third one that immediately jumps out that I would never sell, like uh, come hell or high water. Uh, I don't know. That's that's tough. That's tough. So here's, I, I rarely sell pieces for the record. So folks that are asking around um, like selling, right? And But this does go back to the fact that I think my collection has definitely gotten a bit bloated. Um, and there are pieces I don't wear as much. And uh, like, what do I do? Do I just keep hoarding? Like I know Archie <laughs> right. believes that you have to hoard and just keep collecting and own. But at the end of the day, I mean, there is, and this sounds a little bit funny. There, it could be a little bit stressful in the morning trying to figure out what you want to wear or whatnot, and having too many things. It's probably not a good thing for the psyche. But so this is where maybe I do divert a little bit from uh, folks who want to just amass collections. Uh, I made a comment earlier on the last stream around what's a Grail watch. I actually don't believe in Grail watches. I believe in the Grail collection. What is a good number of pieces to? Uh, to own and hold on to. And that's where I feel like there's definitely pieces in the collection that could be pruning, that should be pruned. A cars of Chrono, if I may ask, um, what is the definition of a grail? Like, is it something that's attainable or is it something that should be legitimately, legitimately luxury? So I, I see in my Facebook group quite often, like, oh, I bought a Seiko, that's my grail. I bought an Oris, that's my grail. Like, in my opinion, that, in, my, in my humble opinion, uh, no disrespect to anyone who may own these watches, but in my opinion, that cheapens the idea of luxury. That makes, in my opinion, that makes the idea of luxury affordable. And luxury shouldn't be affordable. Like our true luxury says, it has to hurt. Um, <laughs> you know, you know, well, a lot of will, but at the same time, you know, I feel like he does have a point. Like it should hurt. You know, it should, it should make you say, God damn, that was a fucking lot of money, you know? At the same time, you know, I, I feel like, a Seiko shouldn't shouldn't qualify as that. So, I, feel like the, I feel like the word grail is overused. So like Joe, you, I mean, you bring up some really good valid points. I, I so the cars are on hurting, right? So hurting in terms of it's something that you have to stretch. It's called a stretch goal, right? Where it's something maybe obviously within well realm of reason, it's going to take some effort to achieve. Uh, but everything's relative, right? A Grand Seiko to you, maybe, yeah, something that you can just drop a credit card in for other folks. And we got to really keep things in perspective because I do think in this uh, watch community, uh, people lose sense of reality in right. terms like we're talking about Rolexes, like, oh, we have three Rolexes, we have four. I mean, it's ridiculous. If you think about the world and how most people, the vast majority of people in this world cannot afford a Rolex. Everything's relative. So the person that, uh, yeah, that 
straws for uh, that maybe a Seiko or whatever that piece is. For them, it may be the grail. And to me, the grail, simply put, is something that's a stretch goal. It's a stretch. It's not Mark, unobtainable. It's stretch. Marco, do you agree with this? Because I, I know you're a bit of a watch now, Marco. Like, do you agree? I'm we'll get into I don't equate it with luxury at all. At all. <laughs> we'll, we'll get into it in a second. We got a question from Lord of Flex, 68 Carmen Gia Coupe, 1600 CC. Thoughts on the car? I don't know what this is. It's a car and gear. It's a special little car. He's asking his opinion. Does he like it? Do I? Do I like no. it? Yeah. It's, it's, Check it's, my gram. You'll know. You'll know the answer. <laughs> what a flag. Okay. There you I go. Mean, That's yeah, your answer. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. What a flag. I mean, what's uh, what's actually? Can you just chat? What you're into? What sort of? Uh, cars you're into and i'll give you a more balanced perspective it's a little bit of a binary question i can give you an uh, yeah i'll give you a perspective on it but just want to say what sort of cars yeah. you're into uh, i just want to bring this up because we do have a major jorn hater in the crowd i don't know what's going on but we got kim and jeff he hates jorn supposedly because i don't know he's a major hater in the chat tonight he said opinions on jorn stabbing dial instead of engine turning cheap way do you think listen i'll say that a lot of brands do it i don't think it's a cheap way of doing things. And at the end of the day, I mean, listen, you can critique it because of that, but don't forget that that will raise the cost tremendously and that will make it a lot more unobtainable to the average person. So uh, listen, I understand maybe the critique may be justified, but at the same time, like, uh, I don't, I don't get, I don't get this, this kind of hate. Uh, here's the thing, Marco. Here's one thing I learned a long time ago. I don't, this Kim, Jeff, Breslow, whoever they are. <laughs> I think they had a few comments tonight. I would love for them to actually have the pieces. <laughs> right. Show us a gram, show us what, you know, they actually have a real honest assessment. I mean, you can chip shot in from the peanut gallery, everything you want, right. but uh, yeah, show me the money, man. <laughs> exactly. Like, listen, guys, yeah, I, I don't right. want us to start, start like, like picking on little D like any watch you can pick on <laughs> little it. details. You know what I mean? Like Kerry Voodalainen doesn't have the, the insane technical prowess that I will say Jorn does have, you know what I mean? He's achieved a lot more innovative things than Kerry has. And Kerry's still my favorite independent watchmaker, but I just look at it objectively. You know what I mean? I still like Kerry better, but that doesn't mean one is better than the other. It has to be zero sum. You know what I mean? Like, let's. These are incredible works of art. You know what? I mean? There's there's no reason why we should be hating, guys. No hate. There should be no hate. Yeah. But people just want to hate to hate. That's all right. Right. <laughs> there's so that. we do it's have. Also... <laughs> right. Exactly. We got uh, <laughs> Dylan Smith who who says a grail could be any watch. I think, but the idea of a grail is the single aspirational watch you see. So see. I'm more in this camp, right? When right. I think of a grail watch, I think holy grail, right? It's something that's totally unobtainable. It's something that you have to aspire for. It's something that you'll likely never, ever achieve or you shouldn't achieve. You know what I mean? Sometimes grails are meant to be things that you'll never purchase, but that you look from the outside. You know, they say, don't meet your heroes. This should be like your hero that you never meet. That's the idea. But I can like I, I agree, I, Marco. I, agree, I understand like, at the same time cars and Corona's perspective, and that a watch can be a Grail watch. Listen, the GMT Master that I have, the Bruce Wayne, is a Grail watch for a lot of people, and it was it's certainly a Grail level watch for me. I mean, right. adding that watch to my collection was a, I mean, it was a hell of a, it was a hell of an achievement for me. You know what I mean? It felt amazing. Obviously, the story behind it is even more incredible, but uh, you know. That is to me a grail level piece at the same time. So I, I hear Cars and Corona's opinion. And, you know, as I, I don't want to say mature or as I come to think about it more and more, because obviously I'm reflecting about watches 24 7, I do hear Cars and Corona and I do tend to agree with him more and more. Marco, at the same time, though, I feel like. I feel like at your age and your mindset, I feel like it has to be rich, though. I feel like it has to be something that nobody can afford. <laughs> it makes somebody jealous or ashamed to look at, you know? Like well, it's subjective. And, and See, that's right. where you're it's wrong. Relative, exactly. Relative. exactly. You're, that's where you're wrong. It's subjective. It has it's nothing relative. to do with luxury, right? It's very personal. You know what I mean? Like somebody but, who – I mean, could you call it citizens like, – like, Mark, could you call it citizens – I've run of the mill citizens of grail. Like, could you honestly stand or rather sit there and say, yeah, Joe, citizens I mean, so is the grail? Joe, I, it's weird. It's an interesting perspective, not weird, that you have. Like, citizens, like, again, this is an echo chamber we're in. Like, 
to you, citizens may not be a grail, but there are folks who can't afford a citizens. That there's there's stop boys in supermarkets that have to work three months to afford. I, like, a I don't, I don't know why people. we're talking about certain brands where it's not considered grail. Everything is relative. I, I'm, I'm just running off of Marco. Like I'm just running off of Marco. Like I know, like he'll say sometimes, like like uh, I, I'm not trying to I'm not trying to pick I'm not trying to pick at you, Marco. Like literally, I'm not. Like, like I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll say like this. Say like you know certain brands will be shitters. Like I mean just. <laughs> Whether you're joking or not, you more or less. I mean, so be it. But I, I just feel like Marco. Like I feel like if it's not a certain amount, like you don't consider it as a legitimate watch. For me personally, no, Citizen is not a grail watch, right? But that's the idea, right? The value exactly. is very subjective. That's the problem, right? And when you're dealing with any product, period, right? People will evaluate and assess it in different ways, right? So you can't. It's very narcissistic to say, well, because it's not a grail watch, or I would never even consider this a grail watch in my in my collection, that it isn't a grail watch for somebody else, right? I just don't believe that. Listen, horologically speaking, I think they're I mean, I'm gonna say it out straight, they're shitters, right? That's what I would call it. Exactly. There it is. There it is. There it is. But, there but, it is. But it doesn't it doesn't mean that for others it isn't a great watch, right? But but listen, I'm in a different headspace in the in what I collect. Do you understand? Yeah. So that's your why peers. it's different absolutely, for me. Absolutely. You're in your peers headspace. The you're, peers exactly. are your... you're like ten levels above everyone else. You can look down on everybody else and say, you know what, that's garbage. You know, that's that that Hamilton, that pizza cutter is garbage. Don't buy right. it, you know. But, listen. I would say that I wouldn't buy it again. You know what I mean? Like I, <laughs> I, when, listen, when I bought it though, it was a lot of money for me. You know what I, like it was at the time, a watch that was extreme. Like for me at the time, at, at my age, when I bought that, I was about 18 years old when I bought that, right? Yeah, I mean, it was almost 2000 that, Canadian. Marco, though. You didn't know what you were buying. You, you just, you just seen the price tag and thought. But it nonetheless, it was still, it was still pretty damn expensive for me to buy. You know what I mean? For some people, it's, uh, it's their grail. It's, it's, it's understandable. Enough. I have some friends, you know what I mean? I showed them my first Rolex, which was the Datejust, and they showed me their Tag Heuer, this and that. And like, I still respect it. Like, you have a, you have a passion. You know what I mean? It's not about like how much it costs. It's about like if you actually like the watch, you know? <laughs> Going back to Lord of Flight says, so this car was my grail from 12 years old, bought it and loved it from 32. I haven't bought my grail watch yet, but when I do, I figure I'll be satisfied if experience means anything. Well, I mean, yeah, like, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I don't really know what to say to that. You know what? I mean? Experience is everything for sure. You got to experience the watch to, to determine if it's your grail. Sometimes you, you get a what you think that that watch is going to be incredible you read up on all the text and specs, but when you wear it for a couple of days or, you know, you see it in person, it just, it doesn't resonate with you the same way that I, you thought of it. I agree, Michael, hundred percent. I agree right. on that. I mean, listen, experience is everything. No question about it. Gentleman's hand says one man's grill is another man's shitter. It's a good way to put it, right? It's a good way to put it. Exactly. But uh, yeah, guys, we have gone on for almost an hour and 15 minutes. I do want to, Again, I want to keep this kind of succinct. I don't like doing these three-hour shows like Tim does likes to do. So I want to yeah, thank, of course, on forever. first and foremost, Cars and Corona for doing this. I really appreciate doing this kind of one-on-one -on -one interview with me. It's been really enjoyable. I really like talking watches. I hope we can do it again soon. I, of course, want to join all the people. Uh, I, sorry, I want to thank all the people who joined me on the panel, Stefano, Hans, and, of course, Joe Kramer, all the people in chat, all the people, of course, who – uh, upload the stream guys make sure to like if you haven't subscribed already please be sure to subscribe and of course also check out my guys tim wright gentlemen's hangout subscribe to their channels and uh you know thank you all for watching again thank you for the support thank you to all the guys who super chatted hope to see you again soon take care everybody all right see you. take care have a good night